Welcome everyone again to another episode of the IDME show, the show that profiles the people behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators, and for all those that like really great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor. I'm your exponential health ambassador along for this journey. Uh, today we are going to touch on, on several themes that we've touched on on previous shows, uh, including natural products, biodiversity, conservation, innovation, Africa. Uh, as well as island uh, and micronations, and really bring them all together into what I feel is going to be a rather exciting episode. Uh, as we've discussed in the past, you know, throughout the 20th century, uh, the natural world, uh, primarily plants, fungi, bacteria, uh, have formed the basis for a wide range of pharmaceuticals, healthcare products used by people around the world, uh, generating amounts of wealth and building the economy. Uh, many scientists believe we've only touched the surface of what the natural world and its range of organisms uh, have to teach us. Uh, and we are learning more and more every day about newer research disciplines, uh, the way non-human species affect us uh, beneficially, whether that's the study of the microbiome, the virome, uh, the unique combinatorial ways that nature solves problems as opposed to the single magic bullet that our pharmaceutical industries love to develop. And lastly, you know, as current environmental disasters continue to remind us, uh, hundreds of millions to billions of years of, of wonderful evolutionary knowledge that's locked up in nature uh, can be wiped out and lost forever. Our guest today is Dr. Amina Gharib Fakim. Uh, she is a, a Mauritian biodiversity scientist and politician who served as the president of Mauritius from 2015 to 2018. Her autobiography is entitled Amina Gharib Fakim, My Journey. Uh, Dr. Group Fakim is the first woman elected as president of the country, a third woman to have served as head of state. Uh, she graduated from the University of Surrey uh, with a bachelor's in chemistry and obtained her PhD in organic chemistry at Exeter University. She returned home to Mauritius in 1987, uh, where she took employment at the University of Mauritius, where she was professor uh, with the chair in organic chemistry, and where she served as the dean of both the faculty of science and as pro vice chancellor. Uh, she worked as the managing director of CIDP Research Innovation, formerly known as CEFR, the Center for Phytotherapy Research, uh, and has been involved in publishing several scientific books uh, on related topics, including but not limited to Mauritius through its medicinal plants, towards a better understanding of medicinal plants in the Neocean Islands, uh, novel plant bioresources, application in food, medicine, and cosmetic, chemistry for sustainable development of Africa, a uh, fab fabulous list of resources. Uh, she served as the chairperson of the International Council for the Scientific Union, a regional Office for Africa prior to presidency. Uh, Dr. Group Fakim has also been a recipient of numerous international awards, including the uh, L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science, the Laureate for National Economic and Social Council, uh, the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation, New Partnership for Africa's Development for African Women in Science Award, and the African Union Award for Women in Science. Uh, she was made commander of the Order of the Star and Key of the Indian Ocean uh, by previous president Anwar Group Jagdath in 2008 for a contribution to education and scientific sector. Order of Chevalier, Order of Palm Academique by the government of France. Let's go on. Uh, Dr. Rufini, thank you for taking the time to, to come on and join us on the show today. Thank you so much, Ara, for having me. It's a true pleasure. Um, I, we typically start off the show by giving our guests the floor just for a little bit, just to, to talk about themselves. Uh, people here, obviously, would, would love to learn about your background, uh, how you got interested in, in science, how you got interested in um, sort of biodiversity, and then ultimately uh, your transition into to politics and, and how you merged both these worlds. Thank you. As I said, my passion for science started from a very young age. Um, when I went to school, and um, I was lucky to have been blessed with very highly motivated teachers who, even though we didn't have the infrastructure at school, still managed to infect us with the virus of science. And I think what they did, and it's also true uh, for many uh, school kids across the world, the reason why they don't like science, I think, is because uh, they have been wrongly introduced to the subject. So I was, I was given explanations uh, to all the questions I had as an inquisitive child. And uh, so they provided very, very simple answers. And also, of course, uh, without losing the integrity of the science, as for example, why are some leaves yellow and some leaves, well, most leaves green and red? Mm -hmm. 
and also why the sky blue, why the sea blue, you know, these kind of things that young kids ask. And then uh, this is why uh, really got me to be more passionate about science. And of course, chemistry was my favorite subjects all along. And again, I had good teachers and I, I started by getting good grades. So all these were highly motivating to maintain my trajectory into science. Now, I must also point out, because we are on the African continent, and this is true also for Europe and many other countries, where you find very few women in sciences, is because we have stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And the stereotypes would be that girls are not good for science. And uh, I was told that in not so many words when I went to see the career guidance officer. And I said I was interested in studying chemistry. And he said to me, no, chemistry is for boys. So I listened to my heart. And uh, I don't really listen to my head very often. <laughs> so I followed my passion. And I went to study chemistry at a time where I still had no idea, no clue as to what I would do with it afterwards. And uh, interestingly, when I went there, I started uh, discovering the beauty of science. And then I got a placement in industry. And uh, this is when I learned the rigor of research because we were studying at the time they were producing pesticides. And uh, I was there as, a, as an assistant in the lab. And I saw how meticulous and how rigorous research was. So that was a second infection for going into research. So I went back to finish my, uh, my degree, and then I decided to apply for scholarship, and eventually I got a scholarship, and then I landed up with a PhD in organic chemistry, because it's again, in all the chemistries that we have, organic chemistry remains my passion. It's the, it's the chemistry of carbon, the chemistry of life itself, the backbone of life. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to Mauritius, as I said, um, to take a post at the university, and I realized very quickly that the infrastructure I was used to in UK uh, was no longer available on the island because the university was a teaching university and uh, all the equipment was mostly for teaching and demonstration purposes. So I thought to myself, I would lose the chemistry focus here if I stay with my PhD training, which was in synthetic organic chemistry. This is when I started looking at plants um, because, you know, plants remain laboratories, living laboratories, mm -hmm. and um, plant chemistry in where I am right now, um, the Mauritius, which is a biodiversity hotspot, I quickly uh, find out that if you are to contribute scientifically to the, to the body of knowledge and to make novel contributions through publication, because when you are an academic, the mantra is publish or perish. Mm -hmm. So I'll start probing into phytochemistry. So I used my training as an organic chemist and applied it into a completely different area, which is uh, um, chemistry of plants. And then there was a project which was coming our way in 1990s about the study, the inventory of medicinal and aromatic plants of the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. So there I was. So, of course, chance will smile at you only once. And I started this, and then I started interviewing all these old ladies about the traditional use of plants, and I became fascinated. So I turned, I switched from synthetic organic chemistry to using my training to adapt it to a different area, of course, science related, where I discovered the beauty of plants and more important, the beauty of medicinal plants. And I used the training I had to validate these uh, these recipes. And I found that today, they still have a lot of answers for our ailments. So that, in a nutshell, how I landed in the field of medicinal plants, which I spent the, the past 30 years of my life working on. And as other people have said, that you have rightly pointed out, I also feel I have only scratched the surface. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, we uh, on, on a previous episode where we, we, we talked a little bit about Africa, you know, we we forget that um, Africa has been the source of many bioproducts um, responsible for you know, the, the modern pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in, the, in the 20th century, uh, we, we really forget that Africa was the origin uh, back in the 1940s of the first uh, pregnancy test. And then moving in the 21st century, you know, we, 
we continue to see this theme. A lot of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm biasing towards life sciences, but a lot of novel activities going on in terms, you know, the first 3D printed ear transplant occurred in South Africa recently, uh, testing of various Ebola antibody products, malaria diagnostics, and so forth. Uh, you, you gave a recent talk um, at a sustainability conference in Paris, I believe, and you mentioned that, you know, Looking out 20 years, Africa is going to be this amazing supplier of human talent to the world. And really, you know, we have to think about sustainable development and how we can, you know, what we can do with all that human capital. And there's, you know, can you take us further into that theme about how you look at Africa in 2019 yeah. and ultimately where you see, you know, what are the main opportunities in, in sort of this knowledge future this that merges both knowledge and the environment. You mentioned Africa has been um, at the source of many uh, novel uh, products. I think it's mostly the tropics that has been uh, the source of many of these novel products. Africa, in spite of her diversity or plant diversity, if you only look at um, Southern Africa, for example, you'll find over 5,000 medicinal plants. And yet, Africa has not really contributed to the big blockbusters. So the reason for this, I think one of the main reasons for this is the fact that the transmission of traditional knowledge in Africa has been oral, as opposed to documented uh, traditional knowledge in China and, of course, in India, uh, where, of course, uh, Ayurveda has been there, has been documented and codified. And China, when they lost artemisinin, right, right. Um, eventually they, they got it, they got the recognition with the Nobel Prize in 2015 with Professor Tu Yu's work. But when they lost it, because now one of the biggest artemisinin cultivation is in Africa, in, in mm. just outside East Africa. So I think there's a lot more that Africa can contribute, provided we address the issue of documentation and prevent the erosion of this traditional knowledge, because a lot of the plants are also being lost, because climate change is such that a lot of these uh, tropical rainforests are being decimated. So we are losing a lot of this knowledge and, of course, a lot of these plants. So there is a race against time uh, to have this looked at. But more importantly, you look. We, we have said also that Africa exports a lot of raw material. Yes and no. We have exported some raw material, like, for example, the the Madagascan periwinkle, Plantus mm -hmm. rosius, that has given vin Christine and blastine. Sure. We have exported also for Madagascar centella extracts, where we have standardized centella extracts now going into cosmetic products. But the problem with a lot of African plants is that many of them don't meet the international trading standards. Mm. So when they don't meet the international trading standards, we found that they are rejected up front. So one of the areas of my work has been precisely to develop trading standards for commercially useful um, African plants so that the exporters can do that. But my, um, my mantra or my rhetoric now has been Africa should stop exporting only raw material. Africa should add value to this raw material. And this applies not just to the green resources of plants, but many of the agricultural resources that we need to transform on the continent so that we can add value. And as I've rightly said, Africa is going to be, is the youngest continent. How do you use the axis of transformation and the African youth to create opportunities for through entrepreneurship? So this is the next challenge. And in, in May 2019, um, we have found that Africa is now, uh, the African countries are ratifying the free trade agreement that the African Union has put forward. Now, if all the countries, at least the minimum requisite, ratify uh, the free trade agreement, we will have continentally a local market. Right. Okay. So we can trade internally. We have 1.2 billion people. There is already a local market, the same size as China and India. Mm -hmm. So I think already we will be using this green, uh, this green goal, as I keep saying, to create opportunities for the youth. So this is where we are, the nexus of linking up uh, the, the, the vital resources of the continent with that of development through development of the human capital and creating jobs for the young people. Excellent, excellent, appreciate that. Um, working a little bit more along that theme now, um, you also recently made this statement that, you know, 
we need not just Africa, but the world needs these better, realer policies for communicating science to everybody. And, you know, we have so many uh, scientific issues in our face today, whether we're talking about global warming or emerging infectious diseases, uh, the implications of artificial intelligence, so autonomous vehicles, whatever. Uh, we do a pretty bad job, at least <laughs> here in the U.S., of, of communicating these things appropriately. I, I, I gather that you feel that's the case everywhere. Talk a little bit about the, sort of this importance as we are in this, as we enter into this new age of uh, science on all these different fronts, the, the really importance and what you feel needs to be done to, to get the message of science across to people uh, in, the, in this day and age. You know, in 2015, for the first time, the UN as a body has recognized the central role that science will have in the countries delivering on the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Mm -hmm. All countries have signed up to this. Most countries have ratified uh, that they will deliver on the SDGs by 2030. This is the agenda, agenda 2030 for the United Nations. Now, if you look at each of the, of the SDGs, right, you'll find that there is a huge input of science in, in, these, in, in these SDGs. So if countries are going to deliver on the SDGs, they need to embrace science. This is something as fundamental as this. Now, how do you embrace science? This is again where I, I always make the plea for educating both boys and girls. Mm -hmm. So you need, as I said, increasingly, you know, a bird cannot fly with one wing. So you need to have both boys and girls together to be able to do that. Now, do scientists properly communicate science? Here, I will do my own mea culpa as a scientist. Mm -hmm. We are very good at communicating amongst ourselves. But we fail sometimes to communicate properly to policymakers. Mm -hmm. Having said this, sometimes we do communicate to policymakers, and some policymakers choose to ignore us. We have seen this in the narrative for climate change, for example, mm -hmm. because it doesn't suit the agenda of some corporates, so they will refuse to listen to the advice of science. But in order to be able to help, Africa, in order to be able to overcome the challenges of climate change, where we're increasingly talking about mitigation and for poorer countries adaptation, we will need to embrace science and the technology associated with that to be able to change the way we do business. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned, for example, artificial intelligence. How can that be used in order to help, for example, countries address so many of the needs? And many of these needs will be done, will be achieved, will be delivered rather through adoption of science and technology generally. Mm -hmm. So we will need all countries how to embrace science. Now, again, to come back to Africa, this is where, again, we have to really relook at our education model. You know, Africa has, has a history of just over 50 years or 60 years of independence. And the education has been shaped so as to deliver on people who can administer. The focus has been in the social sciences. Many of the African leaders have not risen up to the fact that they need to invest in the education system on the continent. So by investing, I mean really investment in science, in technology, in education, in mathematics, in the STEM subject as increasingly mm -hmm. important. Absolutely. So we need to be investing in this and we will need to put our hands in our pocket because so far the mantra again has been we will depend on donors. There is no way. And again, I use the example very often in my speeches. Look at South Korea, for example. Had they depended on donors after the war in 1958, they wouldn't be where they are in terms of advancement for technology. Mm -hmm. And the leaders of that country systematically have also understood that they need to prioritize where they're strong and they need to invest in that space and also invest in the people. So every 10 years, you have seen progress being made with the youth in South, in South Korea being fully uh, educated, being given all the tools that they need, the mastery of science and technology, and I think the rest is history. Wonderful. What's, what's next for you? I mean, you are an entrepreneur, you are a scientist, an environmentalist, you've risen to the top of of uh of mauritian politics um what where, where are you going next uh, are, you, are you going to be focusing more on the continent uh are you going to spending time in, in in international organizations um 
What's next for, for Dr. Group Fakim? <laughs> so I think it's time to give back, and I've set up my own foundation. And through the foundation, I'm pushing for better appreciation of girls in STEM, promote that literacy uh, among the, the girls especially, promote the, uh, the, the fact that they need to embrace the culture of science, help them overcome uh, you know, issues like uh, stereotypes, uh, address the issue, do advocacy as well uh, towards government and international organization on the need to invest. I do a lot of course lectures across the world as well. Mm -hmm. So I am free to live my own life. I think it's time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, you've done so much, and it's uh, it's it's very inspiring. And um, you know, we really uh, once again, I appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, you you have a lot going on to come on the show, uh, share your message, uh, and really uh, appreciate everything you are doing, but everything that you was you've also done um, because it's such an important uh, set of. Uh, priorities uh, for what we're facing in 2019 and how we need to think about moving forward. So um, once again, for everybody that uh, is going to be watching and of course listening on the various uh, radio networks, uh, we've been talking uh, with the amazing Dr. Amina Garouf Fakim, uh, Mauritian biodiversity scientist, uh, former president, uh, Pick Up for Water biography, Amina Garouf Fakim, my journey. Uh, it's been uh, an honor having you join us today. Um, and once again, as we say on the show, thank you for everything that you do and have done for moving the human story forward uh, on this uh, small planet of ours. But uh, really, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ira.